So I've titled my presentation, No More Shall the War Cry Sever, Reconciliation and Race at Yale's Civil War Memorial. And I'd like to start today by um, telling a little bit of a, a quick story about my own first year when I was um, just starting at Yale. I took Professor Blight's uh, history lecture on the Civil War and Reconstruction. And every day on the way back from class towards my dorm, I walked through the uh, common area, the rotunda, where there was Woolsey Hall on one side and what was then called Commons on the other. And if you are a Yale student or have been uh, on campus, very likely you've also um, walked that same route as I did. It's, I would say, the, the heart of campus, um, the central passageway, um, and thousands and thousands and thousands of Yale students um, have passed through every day. And as I walked through, I was thinking about what maybe what I had just learned in class and was perhaps vaguely aware about the names that were on the walls, um, but had, had gave them, given them little thought. And I certainly did not realize that I was walking right on top of a piece of history itself um, and something quite relevant to what I'd been learning in class. So uh, the path that I was taking was, uh, is depicted in this picture here, um, at least a little bit. And you can see these fading letters. And in this bottom part, you probably can't see anything at all, but this forms the inscription to Yale's Civil War Memorial. So my hope today is to uh, provide context for what Yale's Civil War Memorial was all about um, and to maybe revive um, the history that I think um, certainly I was completely ignorant of and had no idea I was walking right on top of. And I imagine many of us who've made the same walk um, also uh, you know, have, have given little thought to it. So the, the fading words um, depicted there are the last verse of a poem called The Blue and the Gray. And it was written by a Yale graduate, Francis Miles Finch, um, and published in the Atlantic uh, in 1867. And the designers of Yale's Civil War Memorial used this verse as part of the inscription. And I think it really provides a portal into understanding what Yale Civil War, Civil War Memorial was all about. So that's why I'd like to start with that here. Um, and I, you can see I took my title um, with the first line of this verse. No more shall the war cry sever or the winding rivers be red. They banish our anger forever when they laurel the graves of our dead. Under the sod and the dew, waiting the judgment day, love and tears for the blue, tears and love for the gray. And I think this verse and particularly those last two lines really do indicate and encapsulate um, the, the goal of the Civil War Memorial unlike memorials to just those who had died fighting for the Union or those who had died uh, fighting for the Confederacy, this was a memorial dedicated to both sides. Um, it was um, conveying equal honor, equal emotion for those who had fought for the blue and those for the gray. And um, I think that this made uh, Yale Civil War Memorial quite notable in its own time as, as I'll show and certainly is worthy of our attention today. So with those uh, lines swirling uh, in your head, um, I think I'm gonna step back um, just to, to prov provide much more of the context for um, what exactly um, the Civil War Memorial uh, was all about and why it happened in 1915 when it did. And let's see, there we go, oops. Let me go back one, okay. So, and I want to argue that that Yale Civil War Memorial was much was about much more than simply honoring um, those who had fought uh, for the Union or the Confederacy and gone to Yale and died in that service. It really is, um, I think, a marker of a much broader political moment in American history uh, and as well as in Yale's history. And it was a moment when um, Yale and the country where they were embracing sectional reconciliation where the white North and the white South 50 years after the Civil War had ended were coming together and sort of moving forward and, and trying to forget in some ways what had actually happened in the past and in the war. And that 
uh, reconciliation um, very much meant deferring to the interests and I think some of the myths um, of the Confederacy and the lost cause narrative. And uh, I would argue also distorted the history of slavery and emancipation. Uh, it distorted the, the very causes and consequences of the Civil War um, in place uh, or, or in, in service of this, this healing narrative. And um, as I said, I think Yale's Civil War Memorial really was part of a national story um, and was very much um, connected to these broader currents and was influencing them. And also Yale was using the Civil War Memorial to um, achieve its own goals of becoming more of a national university and expanding its, reach it, its reaches. So that uh, is, is an overview of what I'd like uh, and I hope to convince you of today. But to start, um, I want to go back in time well before the Civil War Memorial um, was even thought about to, to point out that there's really a long context here and a longer history um, uh, of, of this turn towards recognizing the Union and the Confederacy on equal terms, on an equal plane. So at Yale in 1901, the university started recognizing Memorial Day as a university holiday. There was a club formed for those whose fathers and grandfathers fought in the Civil War. And in the newspaper, the Yale Daily News, um, whose archives I used extensively for this research, there was a question whether uh, this club for those um, grandfathers involved and fathers involved in the war, whether this was for those who had just fought for the Union or those who had also fought for the Southern side. And the, the Yale Daily News editorial page replied, um, you know, this question asking if those who uh, fought on the Southern side are to be included. And they say a failure to do so would destroy the prime object of the movement. So the very goal of celebrating Memorial Day in this way was to bring together the North and the South. Um, or the, and again, that the white North and the white South in particular, those who had fought on both sides. Um, and at the same time um, that was occurring the very same year, Yale was also looking back into its own past, even beyond the Civil War, um, celebrating its 200th birthday. And I'm bringing in this piece of, of history, this context to point out the way Yale was thinking about its history. So um, there was all sorts of fanfare and speeches during Yale's bicentennial celebration. And there were there was a particular speech um, recognizing Yale alumni who contributed to law and politics. And one of the most preeminent figures celebrated in that speech in 1901 was John C. Calhoun, who graduated in 1804 from Yale. And of course was the infamous Senator who defended slavery as a positive good. So in 1901, the speaker, at Yale was, was claiming Calhoun as really an icon of the university, um, strong and keen in intellect, upright in character, determined, tenacious, and indefatigable. And Calhoun being celebrated here um, for these traits, but of course, I think what you'll notice is left out is what Calhoun was so, was using his intellect for, uh, what he was determined to do, what he was tenaciously fighting for. And I think a common theme in my research um, and certainly about the Civil War Memorial is, is not just the presence of what was, of the content of what they were doing, but the absence to the absence of talking about slavery, the absence of talking about the, the cause and the consequences of the Civil War. So John C. Calhoun, who much later will get recognized as uh, the namesake of a residential college is already being claimed here um, to, to represent the university. And to widen my lens a little bit um, outside of Yale's campus, at the very same time in the 1880s and the 1890s through the 1900s and 1910s, I think we can think of that as the demise of reconstruction, the brief period uh, of real radical change after the Civil War when those who had been enslaved gained political uh, rights and, and um, there were just radical changes happening um, in the country, very quickly were overturned. And I think it's well encapsulated by this W.E.B. Du Bois quote, writing in 1935, the slave went free, stood a brief moment in the sun, then moved back again towards slavery. 
And certainly around the turn of the century, um, the, they were well underway as, as a nation in terms of the, the politics and the um, social systems in that move back towards slavery. Uh, on the right is, is a depiction of segregation in the railroads. In 1896, the Plessy versus Ferguson case was decided by the Supreme Court, um, more or less okaying segregation. Um, and, and that this was the, the reign of Jim Crow. So um, this decline and, and turning away from the principles of reconstruction was very much also echoed on Yale's campus too. So uh, this front page of the Yale Daily News is showing the Yale side and the Princeton side of a very big debate that was held annually. And uh, it was really treated as a you know, big sporting event um, in terms of the coverage it received in the paper. And the topic in this debate between Yale students and Princeton students was resolved that the adoption of the 15th Amendment to the Constitution of the United States has been justified. So on the table was the 15th Amendment, which uh, granted voting rights to um, uh, Black men, those who had once been enslaved. So. The, the, by 1901, this question of um, basically a core tenet of reconstruction was back on the table and the Yale students who, the, the Yale side got to determine which, it, uh, which, which side of the debate it, it argued. So, and the Yale students decided to say, no, the adoption of the 15th amendment has not been justified. So I'm not going to read all of this, but this just gives you a taste of the arguments used by these Yale students. Um, but it very much is in line with this idea that reconstruction um, was a mistake. It was a tragic failure when black people had political power, it was corrupt and the um, Southern white man uh, was basically justified in regaining control by fraud and violence to use this Yale student's words. Uh, white man's rule was um, basically great for everybody he says and it was absolutely necessary to violate that amendment. So the narrative that, that this student, um, and I would argue many of the students on campus and certainly those debating in this debate um, was that reconstruction um, was a mistake and, and white rule um, was, was better for everyone. So white supremacy um, is being openly uh, celebrated and hailed. And uh, of course in debate, um, it's more, I think they're judged at least on their form rather than the content of what they were saying. So, and whether or not these Yale students believed what they were saying, um, the fact that these arguments are very, are, are out there um, and being used um, is a sign, I think, of what was acceptable to, um, to the intellectual community and, and reconstruction was, was, was uh, accepted as, as likely a mistake or something to reconsider. Um, so that really gives you the, the, the backstory, I think, or the, the, the longer history of just some of these currents happening on campus. And so by the time you get to 1909, when there is a call uh, at commencement to uh, form a committee to establish a, a memorial to, to Yale students who had died in the Civil War, um, these currents are what are on their mind. And from the very start, when the idea of a Civil War memorial was proposed, the uh, spirit of it was that we should honor those who fought for both the Union and for the Confederacy. This was not about um, honoring just the Union. And, and again, as I said, from the very start. So um, as I said, in the, at commencement in 1909, a meeting was held and they voted to form a committee to set up a Civil War memorial. And the YDN, the Yale Daily News, wrote an editorial celebrating this decision. I'll just read in part. Um, 45 years have passed since the secession flag floated over the battlements of Alumni Hall to the consternation of the Federalists. This period of time has tempered the passions excited by the strife. Now both North and South may honor characters and motives with a neglect to side. It is a beautiful thought, this unprejudiced appreciation of men. So the spirit, I think you see in 1909 at the start is the very same as that spirit you see in Francis Finch's poem, Love and Tears for the Blue, Tears and Love for the Gray. 
And the committee that started to work from the beginning to establish this memorial, and, uh, and, and you can see in the correspondence, was again motivated by this same mission. So I think this is one, um, it's a small, but I think a striking example, one committee member to another, uh, they're, they're determining which names to actually use in the memorial, which names should we put on the walls? So they're going to be honoring those who have died in the war. And there was some particular rule they've adopted to, to determine those names. And the writer of this letter, Simeon Baldwin says, in striking out names, uh, to, to comply with, with this idea, this proposed rule. We reap the incidental advantage to equalize the numbers of the Union and Confederate dead and of making the tablets look less crowded. So Baldwin is saying that he really would prefer to have the number of Union and Confederate dead as balanced, as equal as they can. This is a, a sign just in the aesthetics alone they were looking for balance um, to, and to, to have no weight given to one side or the other. And um, this, as I said, was really the spirit all throughout the committee correspondence. To give you one more example, I'll read this uh, excerpt of a letter from William Washington Gordon. He was a member of the committee. He graduated Yale in, 19, in 1854 and fought as an officer on the Confederate side. And he and a friend of his, uh, Henry Howland, also the class of 1854, uh, an officer on the Union side, their friendship um, from the same Yale class fighting on opposite sides in the war um, was really held up as a great symbol of what the Yale Civil War Memorial was all about. And Gordon, as a Southerner, had really, um, he, he was a bit of a firebrand and many of his letters were addressing little flare-ups and tensions occurring uh, as the committee decided exactly the look and the, the feel of the memorial they were planning. And without giving you the backstory of this quote, um, this, is, this was Gordon um, offering his view of what this memorial was trying to do. My understanding of the proposal to erect a memorial at Yale um, to the Yale men of both armies was that it was to embody and recognize the fact that each was true to his principles and each deserved equal tribute of praise, uh, that the mingled dust of both armies created a solid foundation for the future of the nation. So just a few bits there of Gordon's letter and this idea that the future of the nation would be represented and embodied at Yale Civil War Memorial, I think is quite important as we look back on it now and implicit in Gordon's idea is that um, as we're burying the past of what had happened in the war, we're also burying what each side had fought for, rather just saying each deserved equal tribute of praise. They deserve praise simply for their valor and their courage and dedication to their side, regardless of what one side or the other was fighting for. And that I think, again, is really the epitome of what Yale was trying to do with the Civil War Memorial. And as I said at the beginning, Yale Civil War Memorial story is not just limited to what Yale itself was doing inside its small campus in New Haven. This was really of national importance and connected nationally. So at that 1909 meeting where those first alumni were calling for a Civil War Memorial, the chair of that meeting was none other than William Howard Taft, who just a few months prior in March of 1909 was inaugurated president of the United States. So, excuse me. So the president of the United States was coming down to Yale, coming up to Yale rather to say, um, to, to give his stamp of approval on a Civil War memorial. And this wasn't the only time Taft got involved while sitting president. So there was one point, one of these flare-ups I mentioned um, earlier was about the actual name of the conflict. What should we call it? Is it the Civil War? Is it the War of the Rebellion? Is it the Slaveholders' Rebellion? Is it the War Between the States or some other name? And um, this was quite contentious and really gets to the heart of what the Civil War was about. And um, what William Howard Taft said, so, so the, the committee, the Yale committee wrote to Taft and said, uh, more or less, um, this is what we're gonna say. And they used the phrase war between the states. Um, and that question was submitted to the president 
And I'm quoting here from another, a member of the Yale committee, Talcott Russell. As a result, the matter was submitted to the president as the first signer of the call, so as the first person to propose the Civil War Memorial. And he was requested if he deemed it best to substitute some other phrase. The call came back signed by him without alteration so that it seems to me to have received the highest possible endorsement as the decision was not only of the president of the United States, but of a lawyer and judge of the widest experience and great learning. So Taft as president of the United States is endorsing this, this phrase war between the states, which was um, in its time very much the preferred designation of the Confederate, the lost cause side. Um, and it, it sort of uh, gave more legitimacy to the Confederate side. And William Washington Gordon um, over here, uh, he was a, a very, very strong advocate of using the phrase war between the states. So um, from the top of the country, um, the president and Yale were endorsing and deferring to the Southern side in terms of how to interpret the Civil War. It's a very different story if you call it the War of Rebellion. And Taft's decision made national news. So in some equivalent of the Associated Press, this clipping was in papers all around the country. Here are just three, but it made it to the New York Tribune. It made it to a newspaper in Raleigh, North Carolina one in Birmingham. So um, the Southerners were reading that the president um, says uh, the war between the states is the preferred designation to, to call this conflict. And the idea that Yale was making a civil war memorial to both sides was making national news. And I think that's an important point here to say that um, Yale's connection to this larger national story is really quite direct and it run through the president's office. So um, another way this was, but this was beyond New Haven was that Yale was using the story of its Civil War Memorial as it was being developed to recruit white Southern students to come to Yale. So in the 1910s and 20s, Yale made a big uh, effort to expand its, expand its, um, a domain to become really what it, a truly national university, pulling in students not just from New York and Connecticut, but also from all across the country as the country was expanding west and of course in the American South too. So in 1913 um, and many years before, there were groups of alumni and Yale representatives going down to the South and um, making different pitches, trying to organize alumni, organize clubs to increase the number of students from the South applying to Yale and ultimately uh, being admitted to Yale. And as a brief connection to, to point out um, just how interrelated these stories were, William Washington Gordon's son, who had the same name, William Washington Gordon III, he uh, took over his father's spot on the Yale Civil War Memorial Committee once his father died. But that same man, William Washington Gordon III, was also the uh, head of the alumni group in the South, the Yale uh, Southern Alumni Club. Um, and he was trying to actively recruit students from the South to go to Yale. So uh, this particular trip in 1913 that I'd like to draw your attention to um, is, is in the same vain as, as that general effort. There were alumni who were going as part of a reunion. They went to South Carolina to visit a, an alumnus there. And one of those members in this alumni reunion was now a Yale professor, Wilbur Cross. And you very likely will recognize his name um, as uh, being recognized in various uh, buildings and roads in Connecticut. He later became the governor in 1913 in South Carolina. Uh, Cross made a speech to uh, a big audience at, I believe, the University of South Carolina, telling the, the, those uh, in attendance about Yale's Civil War Memorial, and um, once again, bringing up John C. Calhoun to say, um, basically, that, you know, Yale, one of the, he spoke in glowing phrases of that greatest of Yale's sons and the greatest of the sons of Carolina, John Caldwell Calhoun. This is in a write-up in the Yale Alumni Weekly about this trip to the South. So 
Uh, Wilbur Cross was once again lionizing Calhoun and saying Calhoun is the representative, the icon of Yale. And he was also explaining what Yale was doing in its Civil War Memorial, which was being developed right at this time. And the people of South Carolina were receptive. They, there was an editorial in the Columbia State, a local newspaper, saying that his speech on the Civil War Memorial convinced all doubters, quote, of the exact justice of the Yale disposition toward the people of this section of the United States. So uh, the, the, the Columbia newspaper, Columbia, South Carolina, was saying, uh, basically, Yale is, is the real deal in terms of recognizing the Southern viewpoint. Yale is sympathetic to the Southern viewpoint, and, and we, should, we should listen. Um, it, it was endorsing this. Um, recruiting pitch that that Cross and other alumni were giving. So to just this is just to say that Yale was actually using its Civil War Memorial to further its own ambitions to become a more national university. Um, and that uh, that effort to expand was closely tied to its looking into its own history about John C. Calhoun and to its present focus on creating a new memorial. And just to continue for a moment on John C. Calhoun, in 1915, the year the memorial was established, there was also a new scholarship, um, a new scholarship created uh, and funded at Yale called the John C. Calhoun Memorial Scholarship. It was particularly for Southern students. So once again, we see the direct use of Calhoun's name and legacy to recruit Southern students to come to Yale. And once again, as I was speaking about absence, um, absent from all of the uh, writing about Calhoun and his connection to Yale and various articles about Calhoun's history, absent from all of those records was any mention of his connection to slavery, which of course um, in uh, our time we see as his principal legacy. So uh, the Southern Club chairman at Yale said, we hope that the scholarships will also prove to be an incentive for bringing more Southerners to Yale. So again, we see the past and the present co co combining and collecting to help for, for propose a vision of the future, a vision of Yale with more white Southern students. And of course, there is a certain history that's being left behind at that very same time. So in June, on June 20th, 1915, the memorial was dedicated. This is a more recent picture of it. Um, so on the floor, this is in Woolsey Hall in the rotunda. You'll see that inscription on the floor. And on either side, there are these four um, figurative depictions of different traits and the names of those who fought for Yale who fought for either the Union or the Confederacy and who died in the war after having been Yale alumni. On the dedication of the memorial, Simeon Baldwin, who was the governor of Connecticut previously, uh, or, or had also been a member of Yale's Civil War Committee, said, we now see that on each side of that fearful struggle, good men fought for a cause which to them seemed the cause of duty, the cause of right. So again, at this point, well, you'll recognize that language and that, that message uh, and vision. It was consistent all throughout and indeed is really um, what they intended from the very beginning. But that is not the whole story. And I would want to point out as I come towards a close that there, was, there were other viewpoints about Yale Civil War Memorial. It's, I think it's very easy to say, um, that people are a product of their times. And sometimes we can explain away a lot of history by using that phrase, that um, the times were different and this was very much the, 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 the atmosphere in the country. And uh, what I would point out, I think, is that there in fact was a lot of choice in how people responded and those choices helped to shape the product, that shaped the times that they, that they lived in. So this letter, which is in Yale's archives too, is from a, an alumnus whose name was D.E. Burton. And I don't know much about him other than this, the contents of this one letter. Um, and I think it points out, again, this alternative current of thought um, right contemporaneously with the development of the Civil War Memorial. 
So he wrote, writes this in 1915. He's been asked for a solicitation to contribute funds to the memorial. And he says, I do not believe in the quote, high devotion of men who fought four years to strengthen and perpetuate human slavery and the interest of white of men, uh, of which men professing to believe in Republican government had suppressed free speech wherever they could do so. I do not think that all distinctions between right and wrong, treason and loyalty should be ignored in the interest of a sentimental goodwill, which seems to exist mainly in the North. So Burden's quote here is pointing out that you do not have to interpret the Civil War as the war between the states that each side fought for the cause it believed was right. He says that the Civil War was actually the war, the slaveholders' rebellion. He uses that phrase earlier in the letter, that those men who fought to strengthen and perpetuate slavery, um, their devotion was not worth honoring. His letter of protest obviously didn't get very far. There are not so many of them in Yale's archives, but I'm bringing this up to say that even in the moment, those um, there, there were people who could choose um, to, to say, I don't actually think this is the full story. This is the full picture of the history happening here. Um, and, I, and I think that's, that's helpful to keep in mind as we think about the memorial now. And to close, I wanted to go back in time to a July 4th quote of Frederick Douglass. He said in 1875, as those, um, as reconstruction started to be uh, challenged and overturned um, and in that Du Bois uh, quote when they were moving back towards slavery, already in 1875, Douglas could see the writing on the wall. And he said, if war among the whites brought peace and liberty to the blacks, what will peace among the whites bring? And I think this is a really haunting quote um, and I was thinking about it often as I did this research on Yale's Civil War Memorial. Of course, um, one of the four figures in Yale's memorial, I can go back to show you here too, one of these four figures on either side um, was a depiction, a figurative depiction of peace, and here in the middle, the olive branch. So I would argue that Yale's Civil War Memorial is the very um, sculptural depiction of peace among the whites. And in 1915, we can hear an answer and see an answer to Douglas's question. Perhaps he meant it rhetorically, but in 1915, we know that peace among the, right, the whites brought the reign of Jim Crow. It brought the resurgence of the Ku Klux Klan with Woodrow Wilson in office, the resegregation of the federal workforce and the epidemic of lynching um, that, was, that was happening in 1915 and indeed all throughout this period. So um, I, I think for whatever history we can glean from Yale Civil War Memorial, Douglas's quote reminds us that there was much more history uh, left unsaid. So I'll end um, with this image once again of this very faded lettering of Francis Finch's poem. I think it's a reminder that um, the history uh, that, that has shaped our world and shaped our present is always underneath our feet. Sometimes it is fading and hard to read and hard to find, but I think uh, on all days and certainly on a day uh, we're now recognizing as Indigenous Peoples Day, um, it is always our duty to be looking for these words, um, the, the voices of history that have often been left out that are fading from view and to help um, listen to those to shape our present. So I thank you very much um, for listening and I would be happy to um, answer any questions that you have.